You are here because you know something. What you know you can't explain. What you feel. I feel it. It's the Matrix. It's approach to regression. It's examples in R. Examples in SAS. Oh, thank goodness, it's the last week. It's the bread and butter, baby, what's your jam? Greetings, Bio 6611. In this lecture, we're focusing on building a bridge from the end of Bio 6611 to the start of Bio 6612, Biostatistical Methods 2, that you'll take next semester by giving you a brief introduction and overview to generalized linear models. We'll first touch on the idea and discuss some terminology for generalized linear models. We'll introduce the concept of exponential families of distributions, many of which we've already discussed earlier this semester or you've been aware of, but haven't necessarily thought of as a class of related distributions. And then we'll illustrate how we can look at linear regression as a generalized linear model using these exponential families. So what we've seen this semester so far is that ordinary least squares estimation is really actually specific to our linear regression models. Again, we've been focusing on a continuous outcome. Now it turns out that we're likely to encounter many other types of data in the real world. For example, there may be binary or dichotomous data that has a indicator 1, 0, or a yes, no format. We might have something that's categorical, like um, green, yellow, red, orange, and purple Skittles. There could also be ordered categories, like low, medium, and high, or in the case of those colored Skittles above, that's my preference of the classical Skittles from favorite to least favorite. There's also things like count data, for example, a count of 0, 1, 2, 3, or going up to an infinite possible number of objects, or also rates. Uh, for example, 1.3 per 1,000 person years. So it turns out there's a lot of types of data out there we can work with and try to examine. Now, because of this, though, it's also possible um, that linear regression models won't always work. And even if we have continuous data, we've seen that there may be cases where we violate our assumptions, and even with transformations or other considerations, we can't necessarily address that. In these cases with different types of outcomes or if our assumptions are violated, it's possible that we can actually increase the flexibility of our models from just the linear regression models we've been discussing to what we know as generalized linear models or GLMs. These are originally proposed by Nelder and Wedderburn and we have a reference to the paper right down here below. But one thing you can note is that in the grand scheme of things, these models are not that old. The paper was published in 1972, and so we can imagine that a lot of the functionality and the ability we have to appropriately and thoroughly evaluate lots of types of data, in at least the scheme of scientific research and its longevity, is fairly new. So let's walk through some of the definitions and terminology and break these down a little bit piece by piece. So let's consider our linear regression model that we've seen before, and we're going to focus using a matrix notation for some of this here. But what we see is we have the expectation of our outcome given our covariates of interest x, in this case, a matrix potentially of multiple covariates. And in our linear regression model, we've made this assumption that they're going to be normally distributed. We've also assumed that the mean is going to be equal to that a uh, combination of our covariates times our beta coefficients, and we've also then assumed that there is some variance uh, term associated with that. We make that assumption of equal variances across all the combinations of our different covariates uh, with respect to the outcome. Now, when we're talking about a generalized linear model, this refers to a few different tweaks we're going to make to our assumptions. First, we're going to drop this normality requirement. Second, we're going to see that we'll be able to relax that equal variance or homoscedasticity assumption. And third, we're going to see that one of the greatest areas of flexibility is that we can allow for some function of our expectation of y to be linear in the parameters as some form of link function. And we're going to discuss what a link function is a little more in a few slides. But one thing we use to denote this as more generally or generically is this g of something. And we've just put a little dot there to indicate that it could be anything. It will vary depending on our context. 
So ultimately, when we're working with a generalized linear model, or GLM, the specification is going to include a few things. One is that outcome y and the distribution we want to assume. For example, is it a binary variable, or is it a count variable, or some other type of distribution we're looking at? We also will have to include the covariates x as we normally do, but we have to specify how we're linking them together uh, to the mean of the outcome. Now, because this is BIOS 6611 and our focus has been on linear regression for much of the last half of the semester, we're going to focus on this illustration with linear regression for a generalized linear model, but you'll greatly expand this idea next semester in 6612 to other types of models as well as different types of uh, approaches to account for things like repeated measures and correlated data as well. So to really dig into this idea of generalized linear models, we first need to take a detour into this idea known as exponential families. And so let's start with a definition, because for those who might not be taking a statistical or have taken a statistical theory course, this may not be something we've seen before or discussed, at least not in 6611 explicitly. So GLMs are built on the idea of distributions within what we call a class of exponential families of distributions. These are statistical distributions who have a commonality where their probability density or mass functions can be written of a certain form. And we have that form listed here in the middle of the screen. Now, the way it's written, of course, right now is generic because it has to apply to all distributions within this exponential family, but it provides a common framework or way of structuring our density function to actually have this commonality and we can break apart or tease apart the different components that will also aid us in estimating things like the mean and variance of a given distribution. For example, we see here that theta will be our parameter of interest and so in the normal distribution, for example, that could be the mean mu. We then see that we have this phi parameter here and that's going to represent a nuisance parameter or parameters and also the dispersion which is a concept related to the variance. And we'll see in our example with our normal distribution, this could represent the variance sigma squared or the standard deviation sigma, um, depending on what quantities we assumed are known or of interest. Now, the thing that's interesting about this, of course, is that we have this very, just again, structured form of breaking the equation into it. And these different components will give us the ability to calculate some of these summary statistics and ultimately do things like use generalized linear models more efficiently. Now, we'll break this down in a few slides for the normal distribution as an example, but we can note that exponential families are very common and include things like the exponential distribution, unsurprisingly, gamma, Poisson, binomial, and much, much more, which makes them quite flexible and quite of use if we're actually trying to describe different types of data or model them and find a common way of calculating things like our beta coefficients. Now, as I mentioned, there are some nifty properties of exponential families we can use once we actually get them of this format we see at the top of the screen. For example, the expectation of our outcome y, or that mean of our distribution y, can be easily calculated as the first derivative with respect to this b of theta um, term or function that we'll see. And so what makes this useful is that the expectation depends only on what we call the natural parameter theta. Likewise, the variance can actually be calculated by taking the second derivative uh, of what we have for the expectation above, or b double prime of theta, multiplied by this a of phi, or this other part of the term which was going to only include that nuisance parameter of interest. Now what this also helps us potentially see or make some connections to are things we've discussed earlier in the semester, briefly in the context of things like different types of distributions and discrete distributions. The variance of y is therefore a function potentially of both theta and phi. Now, in some distributions, like our normal distribution, the variance does not depend on the mean. However, we've seen things like a binomial distribution, which we've listed here with the mean and the variance actually having an interconnection or dependence on each other. Or we can also think of something like the Poisson distribution, where we know that the expectation of y equals the variance of y equals lambda, if we're working on that Poisson distribution assumption. So we see here directly 
that there can be this dependence between the terms. The other thing we've mentioned with the generalized linear models that are really important to tease apart and define a bit more is this idea of a link function. With GLMs, we're going to assume that a known function of the mean, for example, saying that our mean is equal to that expectation of our y, is related linear to its covariates x. And again, here x is our generic matrix format. And what we mean when we say that is that we have, again, that function g we defined earlier. Here we're going to plug in this mu term there, so g of mu is somehow equal to x beta. Now, again, this g of mu is going to be a link function, and it will depend on the type of data we have and also the potential type of inference we wish to make or the types of conclusions we wish to draw. What this link function does, though, is it takes that linear predictor, that x times beta, that linear combination of covariates, and ties it together to the mean of our outcome. Now, we do still make some of the same assumptions we've had before. For example, in our context, the outcome y1 up to yn for our n observations are independent, and also those covariates that we've collected are fixed. Those observations are known and constant or set to whatever we've observed. However, the linearity assumption we are familiar with from our linear regression model now is going to apply specifically to the context of our link function g of mu. And this doesn't have to necessarily equal the expectation of y. The reason this is important is that it relaxes our assumptions. And so we are able to relax that normality and that homoscedasticity assumption we saw earlier, which in, again, 6612 next semester, will allow you to expand your knowledge to other types of regression models and distributions. Now, within any generalized linear model, we have three different components we have to consider or specify. The first is the random component. And in this case, we're essentially saying that y, our outcome, is assumed to follow a distribution from the exponential family or one of those exponential family of distributions, which again, for our class in 6611, will be the normal distribution. There is then a systematic component we have to define, which will be our linear predictor eta equals to x beta. And finally, there has to be the link function, that g function we have from earlier. This is going to be our connection between our predictors x and our mean mu. For example, we can say here that g of mu i will equal eta i, which if we want to just take it a step further here, we can say that will equal our x beta we saw from above there. Just plug it in there. And the thing we need to note is that it needs to be something that's analytically tractable and an invertible function such that if we take the inverse of eta with that function, we can get back to equaling mu, that expectation of y. Now, one thing that deserves a little more introduction or just to be aware of and bring into your lexicon to be ready for next semester is the idea of canonical lengths. So again, this link function g is known as canonical if that parameter of interest, theta i, is equal to our term eta i that we saw on the previous slide. Now in practice, canonical links are preferred for parameter estimation and interpretation. Now, for example, if we have something like the identity link that we use for it primarily or most commonly for Gaussian outcomes, that gives us our linear regression model. Or in other words, for the identity link, we're essentially saying that our x beta is going to be equal to mu. Now, if we have something like a binary outcome that's either 0 or 1, if we use what we call a logit link, that will give us the ability to interpret our beta coefficients with a little transformation in terms of odds ratios, those things we discussed earlier with 2 by 2 tables uh, previously in the semester. And in this case, we would write something along the lines of x beta being equal to the natural log of mu over 1 minus mu. Or finally, if we had something like a count outcome and we want to use a Poisson model, we might assume a log link. And the reason we might do that is that that will give us, if we exponentiate our beta coefficients from that regression model in the GLM, a rate ratio interpretation, which we also learned about with those 2 by 2 tables, as well as the fact that it's a little nicer and more intuitive to interpret, if we can use it, than the odds ratio. But in that case, the log link is simply saying that if we have our 
uh, covariate matrix X times that beta vector that we're trying to estimate, we're going to say that that's equal to our natural log here of just mu. And again, these are just being introduced to provide awareness and give a plant a seed so you're ready to learn more about this next semester in 6612. So we won't dig too much into this beyond this point here, but I think it is worth highlighting that these are sort of the idea that we're trying to connect that mean in some way back to our predictors x beta, depending on the type of model we're using. So in our final few minutes, let's discuss how we can look at linear regression as a generalized linear model. Now, the big thing we need to do here is actually first parameterize our normal distribution, that beloved distribution we've worked with so much this semester, into the function or format of an exponential family. So what we'll do here is we're going to assume that we're interested in defining it for our mean mu, so theta in terms of our exponential notation for that family will equal mu. We're also going to assume that our variance sigma squared is known, or in other words, it's that nuisance parameter, phi will equal sigma squared. Now again, our ultimate goal is to get this normal distribution into the format of an exponential family. And we'll walk through these steps here on the next two slides. I've also added some coloring or color coding that we'll add to our equations as we work through to highlight which component of our exponential family the terms are collapsing into. But let's start here in this first line where I'm drawing that star with our standard sort of the normal distribution PDF. And so we see here that it doesn't quite look like what we need it to for an exponential family. We do see that there is part of the equation that's already exponentiated. However, we do have this term here uh, out front that is actually just sort of on its own. So the first thing we might want to do is to actually take this term here and exponentiate it. So we at least get everything up so it's e to the something. And so by doing that, we now see we take e to the log of that 1 over sigma times the square root of 2 pi. And that essentially is saying, you know, if we actually work the math backwards, e to the log of something is just equal to whatever we've done, uh, put in those parentheses there. Now that they're both uh, exponentiated, in our next step of the process here, we can see that we're just going to combine them all within one term. And we can also already note that this log of 1 over sigma times the square root of 2 pi that we saw right here as well, well that actually includes none of our mu terms. There is no uh, theta, so to speak, included in that function there, nor is there um, anything we might need to keep a, a track of. So what we can do is we can move that over here and color it blue to note that that's going to become part of our C of y and theta function, or the plus something there that we see at the top here um, of our exponential family distribution. What we then see for the next step is that we might want to take our term here, the negative y minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared, and actually square that out or multiply it out. And so by doing so there in this next step on the line here, we then see that we can further break it down here to actually have three separate equations where this first term here is going to represent a, again, something that can be absorbed into that C of y phi term, because it only includes y and phi, or our sigma squared, that nuisance parameter. What we see then for these other components here that we're going to continue working with on the next slide is that they do include a mu term that we're interested in trying to tease apart a little more into this format of the exponential family. And so in the next slide, we're going to continue this process of manipulating this equation further. And so again, we're just going back and popping over, we're just rewriting this equation as we saw it before here, just to have it at ease of reference. And what we see is that we can move this term over here. What we can also do is note that in our exponential family, we have sort of this format where it's t of y times theta, or in our case mu, minus this b of theta term divided by a of phi. And so what we want to do is we want to take what we have left here and try to combine it into that one 
type of equation or one format here that we can further manipulate. And so by combining those together, we do see that we have this 2 of y times mu minus mu squared divided by 2 sigma squared. We then also see at the right hand side, everything here is blue representing those pieces here that belong to our C of y phi. Now the final thing we might want to do is the fact that we have a, a need to, and here we might want to take one final step to uh, take those twos we see and factor those out. And so we end up with this format or this function here where we've now color coded everything and we see that we have t of y is equal to y, then we have our just little right there mu term uh, for our theta minus a b of theta which is going to equal to half a mu squared, a of phi that we see here in our denominator is just our sigma squared term and again we just have all of our blue term as our sort of garbage collector so to speak of c of y phi. And so again, bringing forward that information from the previous slide, if we have an exponential family of this given format or function, we can then calculate things like our expectation and variance and just verify what we know to be true for the mean and the variance of a normal distribution. And so for example, the expectation of y is that uh, first derivative of one half mu squared, which we see is equal to mu. And likewise, the variance of y is gonna be equal to a taking the second derivative of that term times that a of phi uh, term from before, and here we do see we end up with just sigma squared as our variance. And so, and then to make this final connection for actually now that we have this exponential family we've formatted it for a linear distribution, we can then make this connection from some of our other lectures at a very high level brief note for our closing for linear regression with generalized linear models. For our standard linear regression model, we know that the expectation of y is equal to the x times beta. And again, that's partially because as we saw earlier, we have this identity link function where we know that we're mapping essentially our beta coefficients times our covariates onto what we, the expectation of y or that mean is predicted to be. For our GLM, we also know that we have that what we call the systematic component that eta is equal to that combination of our covariates times those beta coefficients. Now, at this point, however, we just have all these sort of fancy formulas to work with, but we actually don't necessarily have a beta coefficient to interpret or do inference on. So to actually obtain our estimates beta hat, we will rely on those maximum likelihood estimation procedures and ideas that we discussed in a prior lecture. Now, for generalized linear models more generally, you're going to learn next semester about things like iteratively reweighted least squares, or IRLS, and other different algorithms that can actually be applied for any combination of these random components, systematic components, and link functions. Because it turns out, in many of these cases, we don't have these nice closed form solutions or problems we can work with where we can actually, as we saw with the maximum likelihood estimation, calculate things by hand. However, because we actually already did this before in the prior lecture, we can actually use those derived maximum likelihood estimators for inference, and we'll leave it for next semester to discuss a little bit more about those iteratively reweighted least squares and other algorithms and ways you can take these other types of outcomes. And so again, in closing, this lecture was here to serve as a jumping board or a starting point for your next semester in Bio 6612, where you're going to use things like generalized linear models and greatly expand the type of data and situations you can analyze beyond our linear regression context. With this sort of foundation in place, hopefully it'll make the transition slightly easier and a little less jarring to take this big jump from some of our closed form solutions to these new concepts of how we work with data when there isn't necessarily a closed form or there's other unique considerations. And so with that, I hope that this has been a great semester of Bio 6611 and these videos and lectures, homework assignments and projects and problems have been of interest at times and useful if not at also points frustrating to help build your statistical knowledge and know-how to be able to address some of these situations in the real world and that you'll continue learning and developing your statistical expertise with subsequent coursework and experiences. And with that, we'll end this lecture and I look forward to interacting with you in other ways in the future.